Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pastor Ashley Osborne, and welcome to Valley of Peace Lutheran Church. Valley of Peace is an ELCA congregation, as well as a Reconciling in Christ Church and a community committed to racial justice. We are guided by the words in Scripture, and we find our call from the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verse 8 which reads, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? And so in our walk of faith, all are welcome to participate as we work for healing, justice, and peace, and as we celebrate the presence of God that moves in and through all people. So thank you today for your presence, both in person and online, because your presence truly enriches this community of faith. A special welcome to those who are worshiping with us online. I'm going to invite folks in the congregation to turn and wave to our camera as we greet you and say good morning. The bulletin and announcements and hymns for this Sunday can be found at valleyofpeace.org as you participate in the service today. I want to highlight just a few announcements about our life together. First, a special welcome to any visitors, but especially today we have Pastor John Holden with the, Mini <laughs> with the Minneapolis Area Synod. He serves as assistant to the bishop. So he answered what you called it myth-busting and adult faith formation, and he's preaching today. So we give thanks for his ministry and his greeting from our Minneapolis Area Synod. We continue in the season of Lent, so we are exploring wilderness in this season of Lent. And we really only have two more Wednesdays to gather for Wednesday evening worship. We use hold an evening prayer as part of that worship, and then we dwell in questions of faith. So you have two more weeks to hear questions or ask questions. If you have a question that you've been holding in your heart, you can write that down and put it in the vase as you leave worship. So two more Wednesdays. It really is spring outside, even though it's so cold. But as you're thinking of spring, you also have two opportunities to order flowers, and you'll find that in the bulletin as well. You can order flowers to support All God's Children Learning Center, a ministry of Valley of Peace, and you can order flowers for our Easter Sunday flower garden. So notice the one for Easter Sunday is due March 29th, so two days to get that information to Sally Daniel Tarrant, our communications and parish administrator. And then also I want to note that starting next Sunday, the Valley of Peace Church Council voted in their March meeting to move from masks required to masks being recommended. So that will begin next Sunday, April 3rd, where masks will no longer be required but recommended for folks as well. I give thanks for your continued care and compassion as we figure out the best way to be community in a safe and welcoming way for all people. So thank you for your continued compassion with one another and reaching out in community. No matter how you worship, here, in person, or online, we have a couple folks who were online for faith formation and are here in person. So they are embracing this hybrid ministry at this time that we are in. And we give thanks to God that no matter how you are present, you are valued here at Valley of Peace. At this time, I'm going to invite you to please rise as you are able and join with me in the call to worship as printed in your bulletin. God is in the water that restores our soul. God is in today and tomorrow, raising up leaders, prophets, and dreamers. So, with confidence, we declare. If God is in those spaces, then God is surely here. Let us worship the God of creation. Let us worship the God of wilderness spaces. Amen. Let us join together in singing hymn 866.
continues with our confession and forgiveness, which is printed in your bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and, may, and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us have a time of silence for reflection. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord.
Nazareth, there are stories of you healing the blind all over scripture. You were constantly opening people's eyes. So today we confess that we often choose to keep our eyes closed. We turn away from injustice in our world, worried you might ask us to work for change. We close our eyes to our privilege because the truth is uncomfortable. We avoid eye contact with those who are suffering to avoid identifying with their pain. Forgive us for failing to be your church in the world. Guide us from the depths of our wilderness into your light. Amen. I invite you at this time to be seated. We have what usually is called children's time, but we've renamed it Faith Moment as a faith moment for all of us who are children at heart and children of God. So I'm going to invite John Larson forward to lead us in this time. And John, I'm going to get you hooked up with the mic here too. Good morning. morning. Don't you love the wilderness created by Dan Weatherman and Emily? I especially love the mystery. Now that it's spring though, I'm a little concerned. The bear that's been hibernating back there (laughs) might wake up. I kind of don't want to turn my back, but you guys will let me know, right? People on Zoom, good time to unmute maybe. My wife says my brain works a little different than most. That's not exactly how she puts it. In today's lesson, Jesus heals a man who's been blind since birth. It's a miracle. Now the Pharisees, the leaders of Israel at that time, they don't see it that way. That's because they don't want to see it that way. The Pharisees are also upset because Jesus did this on the Sabbath, which is like our Sunday. And according to their laws, you're not supposed to do any work on Sunday. Good thing you guys don't have to work on Sunday, right? (laughs) Because they are so stubborn with their laws, they can't see the good work that Jesus is doing. And they don't want to see the good work that Jesus is doing because then they'll have to admit that Jesus is God's son. And that would be inconvenient for them because now the people will listen to Jesus rather than listen to them. I think we all have times when we don't want to believe the obvious because it might be inconvenient for us. I think there might be a few children who don't want to believe their parents when it's time to go to bed, or that maybe they should study for their math test. <laughs> Obviously, you should study for your math test. <laughs> um, I'm personally trying to cut back on my sugar because I believe that would be healthier for me. Um, having three brownies for lunch yesterday was probably not a good strategy, and, <laughs> but it was inconvenient at that time. I have friends who even this year, are convinced, like every year, that the Vikings are going to win the Super Bowl. (laughs) And we all know how that's going to turn out. For the Pharisees, it was not trusting that Jesus was God's son. I think God sometimes just shakes his head and rolls his eyes at what he's done for us. Uh, Here he sends his son to cure a man with mud, you know, what, what, what more do I have to do? I'm sure he says sometimes. And I don't know how he did it. I don't need to know how he did it. Of all the things that God asks us to do, uh, perhaps the most important is to allow for some mystery. Still no bear, that's good. And wonder in God's love to know that God is God and we are not. That is faith. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for Jesus who teaches us how to see you better. Help us to be open to some mystery and to believe in your truths even if it's inconvenient. Amen.
Thank you. Our worship continues with our scripture reading. Our reading today is from John 9, verses 1 to 41. So hang in there. <laughs> As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back to see, came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, it is someone like him. The man kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then he went and washed and, re and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, Jesus put mud on my eyes. Then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, Jesus is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? And then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is now that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God, we know this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have already told you, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but, are disciples of, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, 
you were born entirely in sins and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sin, but now that you say we see, your sin remains. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Good morning. I'm so pleased to be here at VOP, as it's affectionately called. Thank you for the invitation, Pastor Ashley. I bring greetings from Bishop Ann Svenningson and my other colleagues on the Minneapolis Area Synod staff. I also bring greetings from the 140 plus congregations in our Minneapolis Area Synod, from Monticello and Laconia, Bram, the New Prague, to our vibrant central city congregations. Um, we join together as worshiping congregations to do the work of Jesus that is done better together. We raise up leaders together. We fight racism and work for environmental and economic justice. We experiment with mission starts. We are a companion, we have a companion relationship with our Lutheran friends in Nigeria. I'm so pleased to be here to be a small reminder of the larger church of which you are all a part. And we see the congregations of the Minneapolis Area Senate working hard on three things. First, gracious invitation. No longer can we assume folks will find their ways to these church doors or online or anywhere. We have to go out and listen and learn and invite to what? To life-giving Christian community. What you have going here. A place where week after week you can hear the gospel and learn ways to serve our neighbors and join together in caring for each other. So gracious invitation to life-giving Christian community, and together we're called to build just and healthy neighborhoods here and around the world. And this past month, Lutherans around the world are helping with money and supplies to Ukraine and refugees from that war-torn country and the violence. I mean, Lutherans are known around the world for years now to hold a Bible in one hand, and in the other hand, maybe a medical bag, maybe a hammer, maybe a quilt for a cold night. Our Lutheran tradition is chock full of stories of folks attending to the spiritual and physical needs of all people, everyone, no exceptions. A portion of your offering every week goes to the Synod, which we split in half and send half to the National Church, and around the world to change lives, to bring hope. So thank you. Thank you for your ministry. I'm so pleased to be a partner in the gospel with you. Speaking of the gospel, I better start preaching. All right, here we go. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, our Lord. My kids love Broadway musicals and Disney classics. Okay, my kids, they're all in their late 20s and early 30s now, would watch those VH, VHS tapes. She forgot to rewind Beauty and the Beast. You know, we had to do that every time, right? And all four of my kids performed on stage in the thriving theatrical community of fargo Moorhead, where I served as a pastor for 16 years. So this is a warning that later in my sermon, I will reference a Broadway play to make one of my points, all right? So tell me after worship if you can guess which one I will be doing if you, if you caught it before I actually got there. Okay, Valley of Peace, I see this. I've heard from Pastor Ashley that you are in the wilderness. God bless you. What a great place to be during Lent, huh? The wilderness is a place where life is disrupted, 
where perspectives change, where faith is challenged, and important lessons are learned and unlearned. I learned the most about wilderness from a campus pastor named Dan Erlander, who would write these comic book-like pamphlets and short illustrated books that captured my attention and taught me some deep concepts. So stealing freely from Pastor Dan, let's talk wilderness for a moment. Once upon a time, the Israelites moved to Egypt during a famine. Slowly, over 400 years, after living there that long, they became slaves to their Egyptian masters. 400 years of slavery. That is more than 20 generations of slavery. In Exodus chapter 3, God listens to the cries of the slaves in Egypt. And God recruits a very reluctant leader named Moses. And Moses and his siblings, Miriam and Aaron, help lead the Israelites to freedom through yep, right through the Red Sea. Before they leave Egypt, the Israelites ate a special fast food meal called Passover. A meal to remember this wondrous event of salvation. To quote Pastor Dan, God felt like a mother who had birthed a child. Indeed, God had brought forth a child, a people who, because of this exodus, would leave as partners with God. God thought and thought, now what have I birthed? Now that I've birthed the people, what shall I do with them? What shall I do? So God enrolled all the Israelites into wilderness school, a three-point lesson plan. One, I'll teach them to be partners with me. Two, the nations of the world will notice how these people live, and others will want to copy their way of life. Three, through these people, I will teach all nations, nations who are tired of war and oppression and greed, to live as partners with me. So God's classroom in the wilderness began. And, like any school, there were complaints. Oh my gosh, the students would whine about this and whine about that, even wishing they were slaves again back in Egypt. One important object lesson was how they would eat to survive in the barren wilderness. Since they couldn't garden or farm, they were wandering in the wilderness. There was no time for that. So every morning, God provided this dewy, bread-like substance on the ground. People said, what is it? In Hebrew, what is it is manna. That's the Hebrew word, manna. So daily manna taught them that God will provide for this day. And the only rule is, take only what your family needs. Daily manna also taught them that hoarding stinks. If you took more than one needed for that day, it would stink to high heaven on the next day. Other folks would know you were acting like the Pharaoh in Egypt. Huh? Taking more than your share leads to rot, decay, and death. Daily manna had a different rule on the sixth day of the week. On the sixth day, every family took two days' worth of manna so they could take the seventh day off from collecting the manna. God provided twice as much on the sixth day, and you didn't have to work on the seventh day, and a bonus, the manna stored for the seventh day didn't rot. Yay. The seventh day, they called Sabbath. Okay, I could go on and on about wilderness school. Question, how many years were the wandering in the wilderness? Forty. A for the day. Forty years of wilderness school. Forty years to go from slavery in Egypt to the promised land. According to Google Maps, I just looked this up, if you were to drive, seven hours and 29 minutes. Okay? If you were to walk, Five days. 40 years. Why did God have them wander for 40 years? Because the Israelites had to unlearn slavery. 20 generations of being slaves. That's a lot of unlearning. They only knew two ways to live. There were masters and there were slaves. Period. God needed all of those 40 years of the wilderness school to teach them a third way. Not master and owner versus slave and oppressed. The third way, a partnership with our gracious God. God gives enough for all to be shared by all. 
Hoarding by the powerful causes rot. It stinks. God gives a Sabbath rest, a day off. What wildly surprising news for former slaves. A day off. Wilderness school teaches. Here comes the Broadway musical reference, people. We are not owned by others. Others do not own us. God is the owner of all. All we have is God's. All is a gift in this new teaching. How do we measure a life? Or a year? In daylights, in sunsets, or midnights, in cups of coffee, in inches, in miles, in laughter, in strife. 5,000, 25,000, 525,600 minutes. How do you measure a year in the life? How about love? Okay, my kids would be really embarrassed right now. <laughs> I hope they watch it online. Really. <laughs> Seasons of love. Anybody want to tell me what musical? Rent. Rent. Good job. Yes. We are not owners, people. We are not owned either. We are renters on this little blue ball spinning around the sun, which takes 525,600 minutes, right? How much do you measure? How do you measure a year? The Israelites had to unlearn slavery and learn how to live as renters with God. Partners, stewards of this planet. So the 40 years of school is over, and they enter the promised land. How did it go? Well, yeah, they did learn some, but it, it doesn't go out that great. First, then they, they thought they needed judges, so they got judges. Then they thought they needed kings, they got kings. Then God sent prophets. And that still didn't work that great. Time for another teaching moment. God put skin on and became our teacher in Jesus Christ. Our gospel lesson today, chapter 9, the gospel of John. Thanks for reading the whole chapter almost. Jesus, the healer of the blind man? No. Jesus, Jesus the teacher of us all. As Jesus walked along, he saw a blind man from birth. Rabbi, the disciples asked, who sinned, this man or his parents, since he was born blind? Neither. Then Jesus spits on the ground, takes the mud, puts it on the eyes of the man, and sends him to wash in the pool of Siloam. The man goes, washes, and can see. Take note, Jesus didn't follow him there. When his sight is regained, Jesus wasn't there. Then the questions began. How could Jesus do that? Was it Jesus who did that? Was the man really blind in the first place? Who sinned? Who is this blind man? What do you think about Jesus? Who is his parents? Do you believe? What, do you want to be his disciple? Even if it gets you in trouble? Who sinned? The blind man, his parents? Which one? How about your faith story? How do you face the tough questions in life? Does believing in Jesus make a difference? Are you afraid to question your faith? What might happen if you read your Bible every day? What does it mean for my life that God loves me just the way I am right now? I really don't have to do anything to earn God's love. This story from the ninth chapter in John has three main actors, the blind man, Jesus, and the religious authorities. From the view of the religious authorities, the blind man and Jesus are, are really kind of heretics. They assume the man is blind because of some sinful act, the way he was born blind, so then they change it to some sinful act done by his parents. They accuse Jesus of heresy because, like you've heard, all this happened on the seventh day, on the Sabbath, the day of rest. Even healers are not supposed to work on the Sabbath. You see, the religious authorities remembered wilderness school really, really well. They knew the lesson of manna and Sabbath, and they were here to enforce it. In John chapter 9, Jesus the teacher is showing us a new way. Let's hear again the end of this story. The religious authorities talk about this man who is blind. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. 
And the man answered, Never since the world began has it heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man who healed me were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you're trying to teach us. And they drove him out. Jesus had heard that they had driven him out. And Jesus, when Jesus found the man, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered Jesus, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I might believe in him. Remember, this is the first time he's actually seen Jesus since his sight is restored. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? This story is not about a blind man wanting to see. Let me clarify that. He didn't ask to be healed. And even today, we shouldn't assume someone blind wants to see. This story is not about blind versus sight. This story is about blind versus insight. You Jesus followers here at Valley of Peace, Keep learning lessons from this teacher, Jesus. Jesus provides true insight to all of us who are born blind. When you pray, give us this day our daily bread. Remember the lessons from the gift of manna, where all receive, where there is enough for all, and that hoarding stinks. And where we live as happy renters, with an all-living God on this precious blue ball spinning around the sun. This God who loves us so much that, that God put skin on to reach us, to teach us, to show us. This God who in Jesus Christ carried a cross up a hill for us. Blessings to you this week as you continue to unlearn what you need to unlearn. Remember, Jesus, the teacher sends you to those baptismal waters to wash the mud from your eyes so you can see how much you are loved and how much you can love. Amen.
Church, let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Jesus formed the disciples in the ways of extravagant mercy and profound welcome. Lead your church to be a community marked by forgiveness, hospitality, and celebration. Send us to transform a world plagued by fear and condemnation. Lord, in your mercy. You make the land to produce a harvest that sustains your entire creation. Equip farmers and farm workers who till the soil. Nourish the earth with ample rainfall and abundant sunshine. Heal grounds tainted by pollution or misuse. Lord, in your mercy. Countries are divided and leaders often harbor grudges. Reconcile nations that experience conflict. Especially today, we lift up the people of Ukraine. Act quickly to bring an end to war. Anoint peacemakers trained in the art of diplomacy and foster a spirit of collaboration among political rivals. Lord, in your mercy. Your people cry for help in times of distress. Resolve disagreements among family members. Save those experiencing financial hardship. Hear our prayers for those who are sick or grieving, especially those we name now, either silently or out loud. Console us with the promise that everything can become new. Lord, in your mercy. Your love comes to us when a table is set and a feast is prepared. Bless the feeding of ministries of this congregation, especially the work of prison. Bring an end to hunger in our community and around the world. Lord, in your mercy. As Women's History Month draws to a close, and the first black woman to be nominated to the Supreme Court has been heard, we celebrate the strength, power, passion, beauty, and courage, and faith of women and those who identify as female all across the globe. Made in the likeness of God, God chose women to lead, support, nourish, and deliver God's glory to the earth. We give reverence to the women in the scripture, honor the women of the past, and celebrate the women of today. Lord, in your mercy. The one who was dead is alive again. We give thanks to those who have died, Confident that steadfast love surrounds them. Shelter them in your love until we are gathered at your heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Gathered one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In this season, we are not passing offering plates in worship, but we do pause in worship to remember the gifts that God has given us, gifts of time and talents and treasures, and the way we are called to steward those gifts. If you are able to give a financial gift to Valley of Peace at this time, you can do so in a few ways. The offering plates are right outside the sanctuary as you leave, or you can mail offering to the church office. You can also go to valleyofpeace.org to give online, or you can text to give, and you see that number in the bulletin. Thank you for the many gifts you share with this community and so many others. rise as you are able for the blessing of our Lord. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you God's everlasting and almighty peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen. Amen. Let us join together in singing our sending hymn, number 592.
the good news. Thanks be to God.